we have gone from Europe to Africa to South America, and now we go to the Caribbean. Dr. Kirk Maigu, political economist, broadcaster, and former senator, Trinidad and Tobago. The Caribbean's true importance in the making and remaking of the modern global economy. Hi, my name is Dr. Kirk Maigu. I'm a political economist, broadcaster, and former senator from Trinidad and Tobago in the Caribbean. It's a real pleasure to be here, to be part of this conference with the Schiller Institute, and I thank the organizers for inviting me. Um, I've been friendly with the LaRouche Movement and the Schiller Institute for a number of years now. There are so many things that we share in common, and there's a lot of projects that I want us to collaborate on, and this certainly is one of them. Now, I'm also a, a member of the official opposition party, and we do have an election coming up this year, and we hope to take government. The platform, the manifesto of our party is, at, and this was from before the COVID crisis, was to create 50,000 new jobs in the economy. And in our small economy, we have 1.3 million people in our island, and the labor force is about 650,000. So 50,000 was a big number. However, with the COVID-19 lockdowns and what it's done to our economies and the whole global economy, uh, we need to increase that number at least to 150,000. And by combining it with this program from the LaRouche movement for 1.5 billion productive jobs around the world, there is an incredible synergy that we must take advantage of. Now, one of the things that I'm always concerned about is that we small states in the Caribbean, uh, we are actually one of the bigger islands with over a million population, like Jamaica has two million, uh, a little over two. We have one and many of the other islands are much, much smaller. Uh, there's a tendency for us to be overlooked, for us to be forgotten in such schemes. Uh, and that is part of our lack of development here. But it is not just a matter of a lack of development. It's also the type of development we've been undergoing. I'm also part of a tradition of intellectuals here, um, started in the 1960s, soon after our formal independence, called the New World Group. And it's incredible the overlap with the LaRouche movement in terms of our analysis and our goals and our solutions. Um, I, I have always found that to be an amazing thing, and it's just another illustration on how the truth is one, and we can all arrive at the same truth from our very different points in time, space, and circumstance. And this is certainly one of those instances. But the Caribbean, the point I'm making about the inclusion of the Caribbean in this global program that the Schiller Institute and the LaRouche movement is proposing is not just a matter of charity. Because what the LaRouche movement is proposing is an end to the transatlantic system, what might traditionally be called imperialism, to the imperial system, to the post-Columbus system, if you want to put it in, that, in those terms. And that is precisely what we have been calling for, for decades ourselves. Because, you see, the Caribbean has a special place in this 500-year modern world economic system that we need to understand. Because our participation in it was central. The, the Caribbean was where the modern world began. It's where Columbus came and his voyage is where the first global in global production of sugar rum alcohol etc which enriched new york boston the east coast of the united states fed into the industrial revolution the organizing of these huge plantations uh, in the caribbean was the forerunner to 
industrial capitalism in Europe uh, and our great intellectuals such as Dr. Eric Williams, our first Prime Minister, spoke about that in his seminal book from 1944, Capitalism and Slavery. So we have had a long experience um, analyzing this, our own um, experiences, because we represent the dark side of this modernity. Of course, modernity has brought a lot of uh, good to the world, but in the Caribbean, this type of economy now has become, let's say since the 1980s or 90s, the neoliberal system. But it really starts from the system of slavery in the Caribbean. Because think about it. These economies were founded on slave labor, which is imported foreign labor at cheap or free uh, cost. Uh, it decimated local economies. We made nothing for ourselves here. Everything was around sugar production mainly. Uh, sometimes some other people had other crops. But whatever the early English colonists had here for their own self-development, tobacco, um, food crops, etc., local settlements, colonies in the true sense of the word where you're making your own a settlement uh, elsewhere, um, part of this imperial system that the Caribbean was central to and this global sugar production, the triangular trade where we were central, this is actually what's going on in the rest of the world. Because when they established it here, they had to gut out the independent farmers. They had to um, buy out all the independent landowners so that the big sugar interests could own all the land, control all the production in a global system of raw materials export um, where the value added would be done elsewhere and you break up the whole chain of production. So what did that mean? That meant no manufacturing here. What did that mean? That meant that we were connected to the metropole rather than to ourselves. So, for example, it's easier for us in Trinidad to go to New York and it's cheaper for us to fly there than it is to a neighboring island like Curacao or even Antigua or, or uh, St. Kitts uh, because our communications were always uh, and infrastructure was always to the metropole. We did not have an internal economy with manufacturing. We did not make our own clothes. We did not make our own food. We did not make our own basic um, basic commodities and services for survival. They were all imported. We were a pure import-export economy and we remain so whether it be in tourism or offshore banking or oil and gas like we have in Trinidad and Tobago. So we've been struggling with this issue and problem for a very long time. We have some great insight into it and which which we can offer the world and what we see is that this same process is happening around the world to other countries so it's as if they took this early model pioneered in the caribbean which produced tremendous inequality tremendous misery tremendous um, underdevelopment this is what the transatlantic system is projecting to every country in the world. Now, solving the problems here will help us solve the problems for the rest of the world. This is where it started. We pose some challenges because of our size, but there are also some opportunities. Our small societies in the Caribbean are like the small city-states of ancient Greece where Plato and Aristotle and the great philosophers um, flourished. Uh, it's like the Florentine city-states. Right? These places were 40,000 people at their, max, at their maximum population. Right? We live in human-scale societies, and these massive megacities, which are part of the old transatlantic system, mainly financial centers, 
processing these huge global faceless corporations. Those are inhuman environments. And I think it is not, uh, not coincidental that much of the violence we're seeing in the world is happening in these big cities where there's so much enemy, so much alienation, and a lack of humanity of the face-to-face -face societies that we have here in the Caribbean that have produced such amazing creativity, such amazing thinkers like V.S. Naipaul, like Sir Arthur Lewis, like Derek Walcott, like C.L.R. James, from such tiny, tiny, small islands. Uh, so it's a, this is a plea, a reminder to think of how we can take our outlying territories, which seem like outliers in the world system, but were essential for the development of the modern world system. And I dare say we can play an essential part in the remaking of that world system to a more humane global system. So I want to thank you for the opportunity to make our presentation. I look forward to questions and to interacting with you and also partnering in the future. Thanks very much. Thank you also. This question is from Ambassador Mauricio Ortiz, who is the ambassador of Costa Rica to Canada. And he says, in your proposal, you mentioned, quote, an emergency mission to build a fully functional health infrastructure for the world, particularly in South America, Africa, and parts of Asia, unquote. This proposal is very much needed in those regions. Are the international financial institutions willing to invest in that proposal? And what will be the arguments from the Schiller Institute to these institutions to make it real? If your proposal is realized, you might note that our country, Costa Rica, has an efficient primary health system with more than 1,000 rural health posts, and along with Chile and Cuba, one of the best health programs in Latin America. This is a system that can be replicated in other countries, including developed countries. I'm going to um, just ask the other question here as well. This one comes from the mission of Colombia to the United Nations. Uh, dear all, on behalf of the permanent mission of Colombia uh, to the UN, I would like to pose the following question. How can Latin America play a determining role in the consolidation of this new global configuration? Best regards, Carolina Gutierrez Bacci. She is the third secretary. Okay, so what we're gonna do is this. You can choose to uh, address either of the questions or neither of the questions because you only have, as I said, a couple of minutes. Now I want to go to Kirk Maigu, whose presentation I particularly appreciated. Ah, thank you very much. Yeah, I'll quickly address the problem. Uh, we're close neighbors with Costa Rica and, and we have some links with them that we've established recently. And this problem of self-sufficiency is something, especially for a small society and all these small little islands, um, the question of self-sufficiency in everything is just simply not there. And so people have even asked questions whether we deserve to be independent, right? Or should we be permanent colonies? These, these are questions that, that stay with us in, uh, in, uh, even after independence. And it's something we struggle with. Uh, we do have to have a system uh, where, where we do access, just as the last speaker said, the best you know, health care possible for all humanity. But we cannot simply be recipients, receivers of these things, uh, dependents, colonial dependents, as we have been for 500 years. We have to have this system where we are also producers. So what is the system of, of creating a local economy, of local production, where we are contributing to our own development as well as participating with others. Now that is a type of system that the global system, that the global financial system has been against and has um, and never been for. Right? And it, it is the old imperial system and they are just merely modern continuations of that. And what we have to do, what our task is, is to create this new system, not just money from the old system 
to create this. But how do we make the system of where not only do we each benefit from the best the world has to offer, but that we are also contributors as full human beings to it as well. And that's where I would like to leave it. Okay, thank you.